Hello, my name is Christy Barnett and I'm the Community Relations Manager for BREC. That's the Parks and Recreation Commission for the Parish of East Baton Rouge in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I'm here today as part of the Academy's Legend Series and I'm here with a legend in itself, uh, Mr. Young. He is known to everyone who works with him as Mr. Young, but everyone else calls him Eugene Young and he is the Superintendent of Parks. Thank you, you for doing? doing this today. Okay, we're going to get started and we're going to ask you, the first question I'm going to ask you is about your personal history with um, Parks and Recreation, where you got started and uh, why you wanted to do this. Well, you know, Christy, it goes a long, long way back. I guess I was very fortunate. Uh, I really love this field from my very beginnings. Uh, I have to go all the way back to about the age of 15. I was a basketball star in high school, and I loved athletics. And uh, during World War uh, II, uh, a lot of the men at that time were going into service and there just wasn't a lot of men to do a lot of things. So an opportunity came to me. Uh, I had an older brother uh, who was working at a summer camp in Kerrville, Texas. And uh, this was a camp that uh, was during the summer. They had six week sessions and the people at that camp were uh, young kids whose parents had a lot of money and they just didn't have enough counselors so he was my older brother was able to get me a job there and that was really the first job in the beginning of my work in recreation uh, it was quite an interesting experience uh, the youngsters at that camp uh, I had two uh, youngsters in a cabin with me their daddy was president of Mexico uh, some of the all men in Texas had their children there right. and so it was quite an experience and I worked there some three different summers uh, because of my uh, athletic ability and everything I even got to work in high school as a substitute uh, physical education teacher and so I was beginning to get those experiences even before I went got out of high school I went on after I was out of high school. Uh, the war was still going on, so I went into service. I went to Korea. I spent some 15 months uh, in Korea, came back, and uh, I felt like I was behind in my life. So mm -hmm. I go to the universities, to, and first I went to uh, Texas University where I got my degree in administration of youth training agencies which was a great degree because at that school, I had opportunity to uh, have a lot of minors, and like I had minor in business, minor in sociology, minor in physical education, and I went on and on, uh, education administration, and all these things prepared me mm -hmm. for my future, where I was going in, in recreation. And I loved it. I, I saw the benefits of recreation. And while I was there, and even when I was working at those camps in Kerrville, Texas, which was about 100 miles from Austin, Texas, I used to come in and see the playground programs and the programs that they had there. So all of that stimulated me to get into public recreation. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate that I got my undergraduate degree there at Texas University and I had worked at uh, in the Austin Recreation Department but because I had all these minors I decided I would uh, I had to have a major I had to have that administration degree so I was very fortunate to go to Indiana University which was at that time there were only 18 universities that had good recreation programs in the United States. As you know now, there are many, many more, yes. but there were only 18 good programs in the country, and, and Indiana had one of the best. So I went there and I got my master's degree, and from there uh, a job came open in Baton Rouge. And as I often tell people, uh, the faculty at Indiana was really wonderful. They 
took care of their students. They worried about where they would go after they got those mm -hmm. degrees. And so uh, as this job came open, uh, Dr. Epley, who was the chairman of the department, found out about it, and uh, he encouraged me to go to Baton Rouge and to apply for this job. And I was a little hesitant because I didn't know, you know, being a student where this job was an assistant superintendent's job right. in this pretty good-sized city. And I told him I didn't know if I could make that. Uh, I didn't know if I really should apply, but he told me, you go on down to Baton Rouge, get that job, and if they fire you, you can't do that job, I'll get you another job. And that's the kind of people that helped me all through my career. But I went to Baton Rouge, and I stayed in that job nine years, and we tried to develop programs, and then in, and that was in 1952. And so in 1960, uh, we had brought before that, lost some tax elections, times were tough, and then the superintendent who was my boss left, Ralph Harmon, and that job became open. Then again, I was worried because we had so much trouble in the department, but I had a lot of encouragement from some good uh, people, the good board, the mayor, all encouraged me to take the job in 1960 as superintendent. And so I made that through 42 years and saw that department grow tremendously. And uh, it's just been a wonderful career that the good Lord has blessed me. And uh, I've had a great life yeah. and a lot of good people, good boards, good employees uh, that's really made me and I've really enjoyed it. It sounds like to me that you had a lot of strong mentors in your life early um, through your education process, through good mayors, through good commissions, and, and you know that's not a thing that a lot of parks and recreation people can say. And uh, it's really admire, you know, admirable that you can you made such a good career out of it, and it's only you know from the hard work of yourself and people who really cared about you. Um, your teachers that you had at Indiana University, they were something special to you, weren't they? They surely were, and they were to all the students, and uh, all through the years they kept up with us, and uh, they were concerned that we have good jobs, and uh, the students at Indiana are all over the world. A lot of them got good jobs and are real good leaders uh, in this profession, and uh, I went to the right school. I was very uh -huh. fortunate. Uh, to find that school, and at the time I really didn't realize how fortunate I was. But, Mr. Young, uh, how did you pick Indiana University? You told me a little story earlier about how you picked it, and I think it's very, it's a very interesting story for us, you know, uh, professionals that are trying to find more education. Well, I, when I uh, was graduating in the summer back there, it was in uh, 1950. Uh, and I was worried about uh, getting a, be a more administrative degree and from my master's, and I really didn't know much about, I knew what recreation was, and I knew what public recreation was, but I didn't know the schools, so uh, I decided to go down to Red Strawer's office at the University of Texas and uh, uh, just go through the catalogs and see if I could find somewhere where they taught a lot of administrative uh, courses in recreation that would help me. And as I went through all of those catalogs, I came to the one at Indiana University, and it was kind of thick, and they had quite a few courses in there, and I said, this looks like a good school, and I uh, contacted them, and they said, oh, send your resume, and they were looking for a lot of, of uh, out-of-state students, so uh, they did accept me, and I went to Indiana blindly. I'd never been to the state of Indiana, but they really welcomed me and yeah. took me in and uh, were real good to me. I don't know if I'd have stayed. And at that time, they called me Tex because <laughs> I come from Texas. <laughs> and I will call you that for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> no. Tex. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about BREC and how it's different from a lot of uh, parks and recreation departments throughout the country. And uh, how was it started? And, and what does BREC stand for? Well, we were very fortunate. In 1948, BREC was created. 
through a state legislative act. Uh, it was actually put in the Constitution of Louisiana. Later it was taken out, but it is a political subdivision of the state. And uh, it's not a part of the city government. Uh, it's really what you call a special district. <clears throat> it covers the entire parish, and uh, we're the only uh, recreation, government recreation department for that parish. And uh, as this legislative act was set up, then we uh, had to get our own money. We had to operate on our own. Uh, we couldn't go back to the state. We couldn't go back to the city. Mm -hmm. And um, was set up with a nine-member go governing board. Six of them were appointed to the parish council or the governing board of the parish. Then one came from the school board, one came from the planning commission, and then they had what they called the mayor president, who was mayor of the city of Baton Rouge, but they included him as president over the whole parish, and he had one representative. So those nine members were all powerful, and they mm -hmm. made all the policy decisions and still make the policy decisions of that department. And uh, the, the way we got into the Breck name was trying to get back to a word image and help our public relations back there because people used to call us the commission, the park commission, the, the recreation commission. We had all kind of names and nobody knew who we were. So we had a public relations committee made up of some public relations people and they worked a year trying to come up with this word image of, of how they could put it together as some of the other departments had done in the country. So the best they could do is come up with BR is Baton Rouge and REC overlapped is recreation and C is commission. And a lot of times we had a few problems of people understanding that overlap. And once we told them, well, of course, it was clear but uh, in Baton Rouge today, people know what Breck is, but they do not, a lot of them know the Recreation and Park Commission for the parish of East Baton Rouge. And the news media would never use that name no, because that was long. a paragraph in itself. Right. Well, it is interesting that the PR committee did come up with that because in a recent survey in Baton Rouge, they found that uh, Breck was the most recognized logo and the most recognized city or state department in in the capital region, and that's that says a lot for the uh, the outreach that that Breck has done. And, and it's so to be proud of. you know wonderful to just say Breck's baseball teams or Breck's golf right. courses. It it really shortens it up. And well, we've had a lot of good committees like the mm -hmm. public relations committee and. And Breck, in addition to that nine-member commission, went on to set up uh, seven different committees, like we have a finance committee, uh, personnel committee, uh, our public relations committee, a zoo committee, uh, areas and facilities, and on and on, because we believe in Baton Rouge of involving the people. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we get our support, is through those people uh, helping us formulate what is the people all over want, and those people represent a lot of people. We have over a hundred people on these policy making committees uh, that we have, and in our situation, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, we have only really two sources. Well, we have more, but basic two sources to get our money from: fees and charges. <clears throat> which make up about 25% of our money, and then uh, the rest of it has to come through taxes. Mm -hmm. So we have to do what the people want, so they will use our facilities, because this is not like schools where you have to go, it is not compulsory. So we have to do the kind of programs that they want, mm -hmm. that they'll come to these facilities, so they'll go and vote our tax elections, and we can get that money. And we've been very fortunate since in my time there, we have passed 
uh, now some 13 proposals, most of them by 60% of the vote. And people in Baton Rouge have really been good to our organization. And I think that's why the commission and the employees work so hard to right. try to do a good job. Well, that was my next question, is <laughs> what do you think are your biggest accomplishments in Baton Rouge as superintendent of parks? Do you think it's a tax election? Well, I think that really was important and uh, being able to get those through and uh, times when tax elections are tough to get. And we, we have passed more in Baton Rouge than any other department. We're the best like department in that parish, best governmental agencies. And I guess the greatest accomplishment was to see those budgets grow from 730000 to now $32 million. And we're doing six, eight million dollars worth of capital improvements a year. And the people really show the enthusiasm and interest. As you know, we've got now about 95 percent of the people have been using our facilities, our zoo alone. Uh, we had over 50 percent of the people visited that zoo mm -hmm. within one year. And the statistics uh, show in a recent survey that we had made by a volunteer Baton Rouge and outside organization that uh, this organization is well supported by the people in Baton Rouge. And we did want to be the number one governmental agency, so I think we take great pride in that. I think we do. Well, um, you've been in this field, Parks and Recreation, for 50 years. Uh, what do you feel has been some of the most significant changes in the field of Park and Recreation? Well, the world changes, as everybody knows, and when I first went to Baton Rouge, it was really a whole different look at recreation. People at that time, uh, back in the early 50s, uh, we had a situation where people had to work and they were scared. They didn't have a lot of the benefits that you have today. Of course, a lot of the social programs that come through Lyndon Johnson and them came in the 60s. And back there, people didn't have any kind of Medicare, they didn't have any kind of health insurance. People work six and a half, uh, six days, five and a half days a week, and sometimes six days a week. And uh, life was just tough. So adults didn't get into recreation. That was a no-no. If you got into, if you did recreation as an adult, people looked down on you. Mm -hmm. You should be out working. You should be making money and. Of course, during those times, we had those big salaries, like a lot of our laborers were making 50 cents an hour, and uh, some of the other people were right. making maybe $2 an hour. So the salaries, and of course, as my wife often says, bread was five cents a loaf, but uh, it took a lot of money to live and all that, so adults didn't get into recreation. Mm -hmm. In fact, in 57, we had a tax election well, in 54, we had a tax election that passed, and we built a, a golf course. In 57, we had a tax election, and people voted against us because we built the golf course, and adults were playing on it. They, they thought that was a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go for a tax election, if you don't have a golf course in it for adults to play, you're not going to pass a tax right. election. So it's gone 180 degrees. And I think a lot that's changed all of the recreation and the recreation movement has been that, that uh, as youngsters have come up through the schools <clears throat> and the schools have seen the importance of it, that uh, they've taught all these youngsters that uh, health is important and that exercise is important. And youngsters learn how to participate in a lot of different activities, uh, and they learned a lot about conservation and other things that we're involved in in recreation. So mm -hmm. as they become older and they have participated in those activities, youngsters, as they grow older, they continue to participate. We've seen them from ball, playing on ball teams when they were real young, 
getting into co-ed sports in the Middle Ages that they enjoyed. And now a lot of them are moving into senior programs. And we have a lot of senior programs going that we would never have had back in the 50s. The whole attitude, the value of recreation today, and it's so important in your life that people didn't see it that way. All they saw was work back in right. those er days. But there's so much to it, and people are living such a faster pace now that recreation gives them a chance to get away from those things. So the value of it has gone tremendously to the people today. Well, as a 50-year professional, and a lifetime trustee of NRPA, what advice would you give a newbie, if you will, in parks and recreation, someone fresh into the field? Well, <clears throat> that's a question you really have to think about. <laughs> and I think that first thing I would tell them, this is the greatest field you can be in. You know, uh, I don't know anything that anybody could do greater than on this earth than help his fellow man. Uh, and I think that's a great opportunity you have here. You have an opportunity to reach people. But uh, to do this, not everybody can do it. You've got to have the enthusiasm. Uh, you've got to be a driver, and you've got to be a person that can stand up to adversity. Uh, as well as enjoy the top and ride the top and get the enjoyment out of it. But you got to be a leader, you got to be a person energetic that you're going to be that kind of leader, that you're going to be outgoing, that you're going to push it. And I would say to them to get all of the knowledge they can, the varied knowledges, because recreation covers everything. It's not just athletics or one th portion of what somebody likes. It can be anything from people in a garden and as we've seen uh, in our arboretum and our uh, other plant type activities that people have enjoyed those things as well as the people in athletics or dance programs or whatever. So you can't learn enough to be as perfect as you'd like to be in this profession. But I think if you really determine that you really want it, then get in it and learn all you can as young as you can. And don't get in it if you don't really love people and you really want to help them. So uh, it's a great, great profession. I've been blessed in it, and I would not go through life and nothing else. What has been your philosophy and your vision for Breck during your 50 years? Well, I think most people in Baton Rouge would tell you that uh, our concept, and there are a lot of different concepts from different professionals, but our concept was to look at neighborhood recreation because, and we did that many years ago because we saw life getting busier and busier. So we went back and put a lot of facilities in local communities. When I came to Breck, we only had 29 parks. Today, we have 186. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and these parks are all over the whole parish. We tried to put them in areas and neighborhoods where youngsters could get to those parks pretty quick, where they could walk to them where they could ride bicycles, not only youngsters, adults, they know where the kids are, they know they're somewhere in that area. And the people in these subdivisions take great pride in their parks. You know, a uh, street is not something to really say it's a lovely place or so great. The sewer is underground. Uh, a lot of other things that, that you get from improvements from government really don't stand out like right. a beautiful park in the middle of that subdivision and they take ownership to it and the kids go there often they know they got a place to go the families can go there they have community meetings and they really take the ownership and they use them where if they had to cross town it would be much tougher <coughs> so 
I think it was a good concept. Yeah. During and I think I I think that that way it increased our attendance with which we now have over nine million visits yeah. to our facilities. Mm -hmm. Nine million visits last year. It's very, it's a very good thing that we have in Baton Rouge. Um, you've had some challenges though, over the last fifty years. You've had some bad times with these good <laughs> times, and and what do you think uh, was your biggest challenge? In well, Baton Rouge? as I told you a while ago, you got to tell them there's some adversities, but you got to stick with it and get through them. Mm -hmm. And without a doubt, of all my times when I came there. We were segregated, you know, that was the Deep South, and segregation was pretty strong at those, at those times when, in 1952. And when we got into the 60s, <clears throat> and you know, I always said, I never really understood completely all of, all of that movement because uh, we had a lot of programs where we had black and white together, and, the kids got out and played together, and then we'd have the program. We segregated each other out. You know, mm -hmm. that was what you were supposed to do, and it was really kind of shameful because that's that's not what the people really wanted to do, especially the youngsters. They didn't see it that way. But we went through some real uh, tough emotional times. But I was really proud of all the races because the majority of the people, I think, in, in all the races really wanted to solve the problems. And you had radicals on both sides right. that really put you in bad positions and caused a lot of trouble. And a lot of the poor people suffered. They really did because they didn't have a lot of the their their neighborhoods didn't have drainage, they didn't have sewers, they didn't have a lot of things. Of course, even some of the rich areas didn't have it because people didn't have money back there. But out of that, a lot of things got changed and we didn't have money for recreation, but we had a lot of problems when people were upset, especially from the black community because they had practically nothing. And a lot of our programs were in the richer areas because we could charge them fees and get money to run programs where nobody in the poor areas had money. So we couldn't get money from them to run the programs and we didn't have money either. Right. So it was one of those things we had to look at and we had to keep people calm. And I think because the people saw more and more as they got into this controversy and interaction that it was important in their community. And out of that in 1965, we got one of our best tax elections approved. And I tell you, it was only by 800 votes, but that even one vote would have been good enough for me. But that started our whole department out of that time. and probably one of Breck's worst times in its existence to be able to get that money mm -hmm. to get us on the road to doing a lot of facilities for all of Baton Rouge and to make our department grow and to really help people. And you know we have always been on the in the position to try to keep our fees low. We get 25 percent of our budget from fees and charges but we have a tremendous amount of participation. We do it like a lot of uh, businesses now do it, charge low and try to get high volume. And volume is important to us in passing tax elections. So we have lower fees than I think you'll find the people during these times when you look at $9, 18 whole green fees, and we have janitors and laborers playing golf, mm -hmm. and that's important. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's not to build these facilities for a few people, it's for building them for a lot of people. But I'm proud of Baton Rouge, I'm proud of the leadership we had back there, the people working together of all races to come together, and I think we serve, say, have already solved a lot of our integration problems, and you know, you still have those problems and you still have them within the races. Uh, 
some of the segregation that, that may go on to some extent, but all in all, we've come a long way, I and so. I think we've done something to solve that problem, but truthfully, that was one of the biggest problems yeah. we had. Well, let's talk about something on a lighter note. Let's talk about the other people in Baton Rouge, those volunteers that come out in droves to help BRAC in its initiatives. Uh, two instances come to mind, um, the penny drive for the elephants at the zoo and also um, the building of a golf course. Can you tell me about those two? Well, as, uh, uh, looking at all that back there, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> we've done some, I would say maybe I look back at it now, it's kind of stupid some of the things we tried to do, but they all worked out. I, I, I often said the good Lord took care of us and, and he really did. Uh, nobody on this earth that started a major zoo with eight hundred thousand no. dollars always have to laugh. The first guy I interviewed for a zoo director, I asked him what he would do with eight hundred thousand dollars to make a major zoo. He said I'd build a, a monkey island and wait for the next tax election, <laughs> and he probably was right. But we didn't approach it that way. Uh, we were fortunate. We got some matching funds, and let me tell you, that was a big challenge to build mm -hmm. that zoo. But we got some matching funds uh, through the government, one of three zoos in the country to ever get any federal matching funds for a zoo. And we worked at that. We got volunteers helping us that we move that zoo along. And today we got the Friends of the Zoo, which continue to raise money and help us with it, and, uh, that we've been able to make that zoo uh, what it is. But if it wouldn't have been that kind of support uh, that zoo would never have been built, and it's a major zoo now. It's a credited zoo, and uh, that eight hundred thousand dollars through the years has mushroomed into better than a fifty million dollar zoo. Okay. So we're very proud of that and the support and what people have done. And as I mentioned a while ago, fifty percent of the people go to that zoo right. every year. So. Uh, we know what it means to the people and to the education of kids, uh, and that zoo uh, is just so helpful. Let me, let we me had this golf course, which you mentioned, and this was another thing that we we had Mayor Dumas back there, and this was up in northern end of the parish where we didn't have a golf course. and. He decided we were going to build a zoo, and I thought he was pretty crazy, but uh, uh, he wasn't. He was determined, and so we said, well, we'll try it. Yeah. So we, uh, we sold memberships for $30 to play golf, uh, yearly memberships, because <laughs> money was tough to get, and those people giving us $30, there wasn't any of them going to ever play golf. Some of them were not able to play golf, seniors. And, were pretty old and had problems. But anyway, we got out. We spent 32 weekends building on that zoo. We had contractors out there. And I doubt anybody else has built a zoo from scratch like we built that 18-hole golf course. Uh, the, the mayor back there did end up in the hospital one time from overwork. And he didn't mind sending us out at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning to get equipment stuff to take, and we were all there at six o'clock in the morning working on that zoo. But we had a lot of volunteers, and again, that's what makes these projects great, is to have people that help you in them, and I think that makes this profession great, because we have right now partnerships with about 300 different groups and organizations that, uh, help us in so many ways. Uh, a lot of them have their interest, uh, where it's the Nature Conservancy that got us land that we couldn't get uh, to build a, a swamp area in Baton Rouge. We have a historical group that's worked with us. Uh, and I could go on the athletic groups, the parents that have worked with us. and with different groups of their children. And right now, uh, as you know, yes. we're working with uh, uh, trying to do something about skateboarding. These people meet with us uh, to show you how powerful they can get themselves. Uh, we were scared of skateboarding. So we told them that uh, we couldn't do skateboarding. People get hurt and we would have to pay big 
uh, liability suits. So these people got together. They go down to the legislature, get us exempt from liability if people get hurt on skateboards. So now we don't have an argument. Right. We got to get the money and get the skateboard. They got over done. a thousand signatures on a petition. They organize events every month and four or five hundred kids show up every time and it's just very well received and we're going to do it. We're going to get it done. And that's the way you got to go back again to the zoo and the pennies. We were building this zoo and we had this eight hundred thousand dollars we couldn't do much with and one of the local radio stations, one of the announcers, Buckskin Bill, had an elephant march, and every day uh, he invited the children of the community, the radio, I mean, to the TV station, and they would do the elephant march, and they would put pennies uh, in this little uh, bucket thing he had there, and they were going to buy an elephant. Well, it ended up they collected enough money for two elephants, and they named the elephant Penny, and. Uh, we had those elephants that have been there a long time, mm -hmm. but that's another case because elephants are not cheap, and no. uh, <laughs> none of those animals are cheap, so <laughs> it takes a lot of money to get yeah. get those things going. Tell me, you know, a lot of people that I've met um, through NRPA, when I tell them that Breck has 186 parks, their jaw drops, and they always want to know, how did we get the land? How did we get the money for the land? Did we buy it? Was it donated? So could you, you know, fill them in on that? Well, <clears throat> we see the importance of land, not because we're real smart. We, we, we saw some of the big cities up north, and you can travel for miles and never see a little green space. And I think one of the great things that the Chicago Park District did was to get a lot of land during the WPA days, and they put people to work during the Depression and kept those people going. And that's what they got the land for, not really realizing how important those parks were. But today, they're terrifically important in Chicago because a lot of the school grounds end up in buildings, and the people go to the parks. They take their kids to the parks for PE and all that. And we went around the country to the National Convention seeing these problems. So we saw the worth of land, and we saw what it would do in the atmosphere and how it would help the pollution, and again, looking at the local areas. So we have diligently worked at this ever since I've been there to get land any way we could if it was usable land. We had a few pieces offered to us that were really holes in the ground that we never could use, and we turned them down. But We've had a lot of donations. We had over $13 million in donations. Recently, we had $2.5 million worth of land, some 200 acres donated to us for a golf course. So we've had a lot through donations <clears throat> that people have given us. We got land from other agencies. One of the real different uh, things that we did, that a lot of departments didn't have that opportunity, but we jumped on it because during the FDIC crisis back in the 80s, uh, a lot of people, economy got bad and a lot of people let, let their land go, let their mortgages go because they just couldn't pay for it. And out of that, we got a lot of good land. We happened to have passed a tax election. I can remember one piece of land we bought in Baton Rouge that had, had a million dollar mortgage on it. We bought it for $167,000, and it was FDIC land mm -hmm. that the government lost <clears throat> the difference in that money. But the people of Baton Rouge still got that land, and they got the benefit of that even though they were, they along with everybody else in the United States was paying to the federal government. So we got a lot of land that came through the FDIC and we used to go to auctions and they would uh, bring these people of land up for auctions and we would bid on them against other people right. and were able to get them. One more question I'd like to ask you and, and remind you of a beautiful ceremony last night on the starship along Tampa Bay. and. Uh, you were given the Cornelius Pugsley Award, and I'd like you to tell us what that meant to you. 
Well, that award is is the top award anybody can get, and I guess it makes you sit back and think because it's given to people from a local, state, national level, and what they've contributed in the field at their particular level, and I've been around a long time, but. And I've gotten credit for a lot of things. I, I always say I, I, I shouldn't have got all that credit because so many people have contributed to my success and what I've been able to do. And I tried even last night to give them that credit. And I could take an hour naming people and never catch up. But it really hit me very hard to, to be able to get my name put in the list of a lot of giants in this field that I had the opportunity to do a lot of things on a local level. You know, you you just get in the right job and you get more credit than you really should, but it took a lot of people to get that right. award, and I was very fortunate to represent all those people there last night, and it really touches you deeply to know that people made you. It's no one person that does all this, even though you get the credit for it. But it's been so great to be in this field. I don't think there's a greater field. Uh, I've enjoyed it so much. It's meant so much to me to work with people, not only those that work with me, but work for people. And you can't have a greater life than you can in this recreation park movement. So, and that's what it really meant to me. And it, it means a lot to us at Breck that you got that award because you deserve it. Thank um, you. So what are your plans after your retirement, January 3rd, 2003? Well, I don't know where I'm going. Like I told some people, I'm looking for another 50-year job, and I don't want a 30-year job. <laughs> I want a 50-year job. So, But really kidding, getting back to seriousness. Uh, I hope I can contribute some more to this field because I think it's so important to the people, to the nation, to the generations to come. If we don't preserve the land, if we don't do and set aside good activities and build on those things for the generations to come, right. this nation is going to be in trouble. And we already have a lot of problems by people not doing the right thing right. and living the right way. Well, on behalf of the Academy and of myself, I'd like to thank you for your 50 years of service and for your insights and experiences from those 50 years. Thank you thank for doing you. this.